I'm going to talk about the subject of Thy Kingdom Come. It's uh, part of the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the main text uh, I'm going to use is Daniel 7, 13 through 14, although we're not going to get to that till almost the end because it's such a rich text. There's so much that needs explanation before we get to this, this text. So what, uh, uh, of course, when we talk about the coming of his kingdom, that will be ultimately fulfilled at his second coming. So in order to go through today, we're going to uh, explore three headings, three points. The first is contrasting the first coming of Christ with the second coming. So the two comings contrasted. Secondly, the thing, second thing we're going to do is what happened between the two comings? What happened between the first coming and the second coming? What's, what was involved in What's involved in it? And third point, it, what, it, what difference does that make in our lives today? So contrasting the two comings, what happened between the two comings, and then what it means to us. That's what we're going through today. So fasten your seatbelts and let's take off. Okay. So let's uh, talk about the contrasting the first and second comings. <clears throat> now, uh, to do that, all the Gospels, all the four Gospels, um, uh, contain the account of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey. Remember that? Uh, it, the, the Gospel of Matthew has it this way. It says in Matthew 21, 4 through 5, and I'm reading, incidentally, from the English Standard Version. I was told this was the most one you use the most here. Anyway, Matthew 21, 4 through 5, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughters of Zion, to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you humble." and mounted on a donkey, all right? That's Matthew. And actually, when you look at it, Matthew is really quoting from Old Testament, and specifically quoting from Zechariah 9.9. But when you look at Zechariah 9.9, you find that Matthew did not quote everything in that verse. He skips over something. What he skips over is mentioning the mention of the second coming. So in Zechariah, it goes like this. Um, uh, shout loudly, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, the just one, and having salvation. That's referring to his second coming. And then humble and mounted on a donkey. So Matthew, by the precision of inspiration, skips over the description of the second coming and mentions only the first coming of, his, of him on a, on a donkey. Humble. He's not coming in judgment. He's coming for something else. Coming to save. He's coming to die, to suffer. And actually, Luke, Luke in Luke's account, when, he dis, when Luke describes Christ going into Jerusalem, on the donkey, he says this in Luke 19, 41 through 44. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. And not only over Jerusalem, but over the whole world. And this is, explains why. He wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day that things that make for peace, the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Wow. 
If you only knew on this day, of course, Christ knew very well the Old Testament prophecies about him. And he knew Daniel and what Daniel said, mentioning and expounding the, what's called the 70 weeks, what happens at the end of the 69th week. And studies have shown that you could boil it down to the very date. In this day, if Jerusalem, if the world only knew what was, who was it that, that it was there entering on a donkey going into Jerusalem, if the world only knew, but it was not. It was just, their eyes were covered. They did not know the time over their, their visitation. They did not know. So that was fulfilled. This, so the first, if the first coming was fulfilled literally, it means, this is telling us, that the second coming, not fulfilled yet, but it means it will be fulfilled. The second coming, if the first coming was fulfilled according to prophecy, prophecy, the second coming will be also. So we come to the second coming. So we saw the first coming. It's coming, humble, lowly, and a donkey coming in. The second coming is quite different. It's a, it's a contrast. The second coming is described in various ways. Now, John, the apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, who wrote the letters of John, who also wrote the book of Revelation. He says this in Revelation 1.7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. That's different. He's not riding a donkey. He's on the clouds. <laughs> He's coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. That's the nation Israel, the Jews. They will see him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen, he says. Behold, because with behold ends with amen. Now, John here is also quoting Zechariah, another place in Zechariah. But when, when you look at that place in Zechariah, it says that only the nation Israel will weep for him. And they, they, when they look, look, in, look on him, the house of David, whom they have pierced. But John, but John in the book of Revelation, opens it to, to all nations will wail upon him. All nations, all peoples will say, how did we miss it? And they will weep for sorrow, repentance, when they see him coming on the clouds. Um, now, uh, th this, this coming on the clouds is really a fulfillment of what the angels told the disciples. Here's the Lord on his last day on earth. He's talking to the disciples in Acts 1, if you remember, telling them to go to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And as he's talking to them, imagine that. He's, there's, they're listening to him, and then he's, he's lifted up. He's just going up. He goes up and up, and they're looking at him going up, and he goes up to the clouds, and they're looking. <laughs> and the angels show up and say, hey, why are you looking up? This one who was, who was um, lifted up on the clouds will one day come on the clouds again like this. And that's what, what John is telling us. Someday he'll come on the clouds. That's the second coming. Actually, the Lord Jesus talked about his second coming a lot. In one account, in Matthew 25, I told you there'll be many verses here and there until we get to our text that we want to focus on. Matthew 25, uh, he, says, uh, he says, describes the scene on, on earth. She's coming on the clouds, he comes down on earth. And in Matthew 25, 31, he says, um, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, note the contrast with his first coming. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations in front of him. Can you imagine that? And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd 
separates the sheep from the goats. That's judgment. That's the second coming. Different, isn't it? It continues. And he will place his sheep on his right, but the goats, unbelievers, on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Here it is, thy kingdom come. This is fulfillment, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is his kingdom. That's his second coming. Um, actually, again, John in his book of Revelation, in the climactic chapter of 19, chapter 19, he explains that, he describes that in detail, the glory of his second coming, and describe him, you can read it there at your leisure, coming on a white horse, in contrast to a donkey, with great glory and myriads of angels with him. And as the nations gather to destroy Jerusalem, he wipes them, defeats them, ends all evil, as well as the Antichrist and his false prophet, and then establishes his kingdom again, chapter 20. And for the interest of time, we won't read those texts. But the point is, his second coming is different than his first coming, isn't it? That's just very different. That's his first coming. It's his second coming. This was fulfilled according to prophecy. This will also be fulfilled perfectly. And that's what we wait for someday. So that's, a, that's the first point, contrasting the first coming with the second coming. The second point is, what happened between the two? What happened between the first coming and the second coming? What happens? What's involved there between the two? And um, actually, um, with, with, um, as, as we look at the, what happens on earth, we will not really fully understand it until we, we examine what happens in, in heaven. What, what takes place in heaven. And this brings us to our text. And it says, uh, Daniel 7, 13 through 14. Now this is Daniel talking. Now I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now, in order to understand this uh, deeply, the, what it means, what's really involved with the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days. What's really involved here. Actually, if you read on, you find that though Daniel saw this amazing, glorious vision, that few have a privilege equal to that. Though he saw that amazing vision when the Son of Man would one day inherit the kingdom and there will be righteousness forever and ever. Though he saw that, he saw it. But he remained in great grief and despair. It's amazing. I should read on in the same chapter. You find that he says this, As for me, Daniel, this is Daniel 7.15. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious. And the visions of my head alarmed me. My thoughts greatly alarmed me, 728. And my color changed, and I kept the matter in my heart. If you read later on in chapter, chapter 10, for example, you'll find that he was so, so grieved, so weak, in such despair, that he was weak physically, he fell to the floor. And the angel Gabriel came, the same one that came to Virgin Mary, he came to him and encouraged him to get up. He 
with difficulty, he got up and, and on his knees, first hands and knees, and then up again. He stood up and he was still trembling with fear. Then he fell again, again to, to express, you know, though he saw this great vision that carries great prophecy and promise, he was still in grief. You know? And why was he? You would surely understand it because Daniel was given the privilege of seeing what few do see. He saw through dreams and visions, beginning with the King Nebuchadnezzar, the dream of the king, and then he saw visions that were interpreted to him. He saw the continuation of evil. He saw evil. He saw how evil controls nations and heads of nations. He saw the spirit world, the fallen spirits, Satan and a, and a fallen angels with great power controlling the affairs of nations. He saw that very clearly. And they were pictured to him with very ugly beasts, you know, very horrifying beasts. He saw that. Read chapters 7 and, and 8 of Daniel. He saw how many of the faith would apostate and leave the truth. He saw how people would continually replace God with something else or someone else continually worship something other than God to the point of leading eventually to men and women submitting to the Antichrist, the one who is against truth, against God, that Christ spoke of him as defying the very God wanting to be above God. He saw how people of the earth would follow the Antichrist and Satan, of course, behind him. He saw all of that. He saw what Christ told us in the Olivet Discourse, that message he gave on the Mount of Olives, how the tragedies that would befall nations and would befall people, the betrayal of people to one another. He saw the evils of the world, you know, that's what he saw. And with that, he saw that this would, this would continue for a long, long time. He saw, that's why he was grieving. He wanted the fulfillment. He wanted the kingdom to come right away, but the Lord told him actually in, in Daniel 12, 4, he says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Conceal it, in other words. He says, shut it up until the time of the end. And he says again in verse 9, 12, 9 of Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. So he's saying to Daniel, it's going to be like this, good and evil, parallel to one another for a long, long time to the end, you know. So Daniel was aggrieved. So he was in despair. Now, we need help here, and the scriptures help us. You know, actually, Daniel is here, and the Apostle, Paul, Apostle John is here. 650 years later, Daniel is watching this vision of the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days. He saw that. John also the same, saw the same vision. They saw the same thing. Both of them saw the same thing. Only John is given a little bit more revelation. There's this missing link here that Daniel needed to see. There's a missing, missing link here. What is that? So we go to, to John. Again, see, we're seeing so many passages around Daniel 7. Bear with me. This is Middle East style, okay? So we're doing all of this. We'll come back to Daniel 7. So what does John see? Well, look at the book of Revelation, and I'm summarizing here in the interest of time. What does John see? Well, if you look at Revelation 4, this is after he's done Christ and the churches, the seven churches. Now, Revelation 4, Daniel sees a vision of a throne, and one seated on the throne with great majesty and glory. And he tries to describe what he's seeing, but it's like, looking from a, from a keyhole <laughs> with 
natural body is looking at glory, and he's using words, he's like this, and he's as this, and he resembles that, and he's not able to describe him because he's so glorious, so infinite. This is the one seated on the, on the throne. That's in chapter 4. Then in chapter 5, he sees something else. So this is, chapter 4 is the ancient of days sitting on the throne. Chapter 5, he sees a scroll. In chapter 4, he sees a throne. In chapter 5, he sees a scroll. And as a scroll, he describes it as having seven seals. Let me read that. And I saw in the, in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, this is Revelation 5, 1, on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seal? This is what John saw. What is this scroll? What is he talking about? Actually, when you study this, you found out this. That the scroll contains the very will of God. It contains the prophecies of God, the promises of God. It contains what God is going to do to judge sin. That's what it contains. It also contains the promises of God to bless those who believe. It contains everything. It contains what Paul, Apostle Paul would call uh, the glory of God. Finally, God in his person, God in who he is and what he's like. It contains all of what God is and what he wants to do, what he's like. Actually, when you think of it, God is the most misunderstood being in the whole world and all of history. Well, this scroll would erase any misunderstanding of who God is in his righteousness, in his love, in his goodness, in his majesty, in his wanting to, fulfill, wanting to bring in his kingdom of righteousness forever and ever. That's what the scroll is all about. So basically, the importance of this, when the, uh, when the angel says, and I saw a mighty angel, a powerful angel, it means that this is really important, this is serious. He says uh, with a loud voice, who is worthy? Who is worthy to, uh, to open this scroll? In other words, what he's saying, that if this scroll is not opened and the seals on the scroll are not broken, it means that God's, Purposes for mankind will never be fulfilled. We will remain under condemnation, in darkness, in ruin, deservedly so, forever and ever. And that's what John saw. Who would be qualified to open that scroll? Certainly man is not, you know. If God the Father were to open it, there would be nothing but judgment. So that's, it continues on in verse 3, and John writes, And no one, no one in heaven and on earth and under the earth, no one, was able to open the scroll or even to look at it. No one. You know, John saw that. He, he realized the tragedy of the human condition. The problem is we don't, re, we, we don't see that. People ridicule the idea of Christ coming, it's the death of Christ and all that, because they don't understand the, the predicament, our predicament, without salvation. So what happens when John sees this? Because he realizes what, what is at stake he says, I began to weep loudly. He was sobbing. He saw it. I began to weep loudly. He could not. Because, why? Because no one, no one was found worthy to open the
the scroll or to look into it. So he was weeping. Kind of, he was like where Daniel was, grieving in despair. When is this going to end? Will it ever end? When? How? When? So he was seeing what Daniel was seeing, the same thing. They're seeing the same thing. And he was just broken. John was broken. <clears throat> but then there's good news. And it says, still in Revelation 5, verse 5, and one of the elders, now there are heavenly beings up there. That's for another sermon. But anyway, that's, there are heavenly beings up there. One of the elders, 24 elders, said to me, weep no more. Hallelujah. Weep no more. Then he gives reasons why. Let me read what he says, and then we'll open it. Weep no more. Behold, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And... Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw, I, you know, John turned to see, where is this lamb? He turns to see, and I saw, where is this light? I saw a, a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the, one, from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Now, what, what happened? What did he see? Look at the descriptions of this one. I mean, it takes somebody very qualified to do this. It's the only one. This is the only one that can do this. Actually, when you think of it, no one can think of a solution like this. No politician, no nation, no professor, no committee, no head of army, no angel, no cherubim, no seraphim, nobody. Only God can think of this. And this is the only way out. Watch this. What's his, what's his, his qualifications? What's that? He's a descendant of David, but he is the root of David. According to the human nature, he was born as a man. He at, he was divine God, took upon him the human nature. He added a nature, a human nature. So he became a descendant of David, but he is also at the same time the root of David, the creator of David. He has both the divine nature and the human nature. And also, he is the lamb. But he's the lion. First coming, second coming. He is slain, but he's standing. Death, resurrection. He had to do that. There's no other way. Not only that, but he's immersed in the Holy Spirit. When it describes the seven spirits of God in a plural, it's talking about all the attributes of God summed up totally in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. All of that is engulfed in, in who he is. But then what's this? You know, this, this is the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne, this, this lamb, lion coming, the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days. Now watch this, in a triune God. God is not just taking roles like he's faking it. He's taking this role and that role. No, there are real persons. God the Father, the Supreme One seated on a throne, the righteous one who demands justice. Thank God he's that way. He doesn't let sin pass. <laughs> He's a righteous, just God, sitting supreme over all the universe. But then in that Godhead, that one triune God, He's also a person who takes on and absorbs the very judgment that we deserve. He actually does that in person. It's not just a role that He does. There are three distinct persons. And all of that, 
is immersed, engulfed in that one person of the Holy Spirit that, that sums up in himself all the attributes, all that happens between the Father and the Son, all that takes place between them from eternity past are summed up in the person of the Holy Spirit. Wow, we have a God here who's real, who's acting. He's a judge, and he is the redeemer, you know. He is the perfect one in the spirit. He is that. So he sees that one coming to the ancient of days, to the one seated on the throne, and he takes the scroll rightfully. He's the only one. You know what happens when he takes the scroll? When he takes the scroll, heaven explodes with worship. And the word that is repeated, worthy, worthy, worthy are you. You're the Holy One. And in this, when we understand what's going on here in, in worship, has in its background are the mud we've been served, saved from, the tragedy, the darkness, the doom, We've been saved from the only one. Only God can do it. And this is the only way. And so he describes that worship from the 24 elders, expands into all the angels, myriads of angels, you know, worshiping the Lamb. <laughs> and then all creatures in heaven, on earth, and beneath the earth, everyone, is worshiping the Lamb and the one seated on the throne, the Godhead, all of that is happening because there is a realization of, of what happened. So here's, that's what happened. Here's the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days. This is what was involved in his coming to the Ancient of Days that Daniel did not see. John saw. And he saw the joy, and he saw the worship, and he saw. So that brings us to the last point. What does all of this have to do with us? Now we come to our text, Daniel 7. Climactically, now when we look at that text, it shines with glory, doesn't it? <laughs> Here it is. And I saw in the night vision, and behold, now notice the words here. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. Now watch, the first phrase here is the clouds. Notice the importance of the clouds. Did you notice that? I mean, Jesus, talking to the disciples on earth, his last day on earth, he's raised on the clouds. He goes up to heaven, and he comes on the clouds to the Ancient of Days. Then we're told that he's coming back on the clouds, back down to us on the clouds. It's all clouds, clouds, clouds. Actually, the Apostle Paul brings it that way. He says, in the day of the rapture, <laughs> when we who are alive, who are left behind, will be caught up together with them, those that died in Christ before us, we will be caught up together with them where? In the clouds, up in the air. My goodness. That word clouds becomes synonymous with salvation. <laughs> He goes up in the clouds, goes to the Father in the clouds, come back, comes back in the clouds, and we meet him in the clouds. It's all clouds. It's all glory. <laughs> then that's the first word. The second word is this. With the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. That title, son of man. Now that's, a, that's Christ's favorite title. He used it 20, 80 times. He only, he's the one that referred to himself that way. Why is that favorite of his? Because, you know, he's, he's the divine son of God from eternity past. There came a time and space where he added on that nature, that human nature. He became son of man. Why? It's, again, a term for salvation. When the son of man, one like us, only he's not like us, he's much more supreme than us, but he took our nature, died in our nature, was risen in our nature, and in our nature, as Son of Man, He goes to heaven. It means we are going with Him. It means we've arrived there. <laughs> so as the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days, 
We're on that journey with him. We have that promise. That in, that prom in that title, the Son of Man, we have the kingdom. We have salvation. We have the fulfillment of the promises of God. Not only that, <clears throat> but then we have the kingdom itself, finally. Here's our kingdom come. Now it's, it's described this way. He says, uh, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given, look at this. It's all authority, all, all of it. All that there is of authority is combined in him. He says, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, all authority. Second, over all peoples. And it says this, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So all authority, all people, and for all time. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall never, ever, ever be destroyed. All time. All authority, all people, all time. <clears throat> so, what is that to do with us? My goodness. It means there's no greater joy, no greater hope, no greater assurance. It means that when we today, as believers, when we sin, when we fall short, when we are in despair, the reason is, at that point, we have forgotten the gospel. We have forgotten what, who Christ is and what he did for us. The power of victory as he was victorious, is to grab hold of him and what he has done for us. He came down. He went up on the clouds. On the clouds, he did this for us, took the scroll, and was able to open it and fulfill God's promises so that one day he's coming back on the clouds to bring us with him on the clouds and so forth. That's it. There's no greater joy. Nothing replaces him. Nothing outshines him. No earthly glory, no achievement, no possession, no title, nothing <laughs> should bring us more joy. He's our number one joy. That's it. When something else is, is our joy, it's room for trouble. So we can summarize today's message this way. The coming of the kingdom can only take, split, take place through his incarnation, death, and resurrection. This is the only way. There's no other way. In order to replace our deserved ruin with the eternal salvation. That's it. So the coming of the kingdom can only take place through what he did in his first coming in order to have salvation at his second coming, um, when he comes in the clouds. This is ours. And he loves for us to be sure, to grab hold of this and be sure as our prized possession through what he did for us. That's the gospel. You know, do you notice that in the gospel, it's all what he did. It's good news. Something happened. He did. It's not what we do. It's what he did. So we grab hold of this. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise be to him. Let us ask him to help us focus on this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, bow before you. Thank you for what you have revealed to Daniel and to John and through so many. All the scriptures are inspired by you. And it's amazing. Help us give you the worship that you deserve because you are worthy. And nothing else is worthy more than you. Thank you that we have something to hold on to that no one can take from us. Thy kingdom come.
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.